Since the last launch, after upwards of three quarters of the satellites were lost due to a solar storm, SpaceX launched the new batch of Starlink satellites on February 21. Hey guys, welcome back to our channel. Thank you for joining us today. Today, we will be speaking about SpaceX finally launched a set of 46 Starlink satellites to higher orbit. Please watch the entire video to figure out all the details. And guys, don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and click the bell notification. Alright then, let's get started. After a one-day deferral due to bad weather, a Falcon 9 launched from Space Launch Complex 40 at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida at 9.44 a.m. Eastern. Because of a lack of pulverized station coverage, the Falcon 9 upper stage deployed its cargo of 46 Starlink satellites 62 minutes after liftoff. However, confirmation of a successful deployment didn't come until nearly 20 minutes later. On its 11th trip, the rocket's first stage landed on its 11th trip on a drone ship offshore the Bahamas. The Demo-2 commercial crew flight, the CRS-21 cargo mission, the Anasis-2 satellite, two transporter rideshare trips, and five Starlink missions were all launched from the stage earlier. The rocket is the second in SpaceX's fleet to have flown 11 times. It was the firm's seventh Falcon 9 flight of the year, putting it on track to launch over 50 times this year. The CSG-2 radar imaging satellite for Italy, the Transporter-3 rideshare mission, and a classified payload for the National Reconnaissance Office were all carried on this year's Starlink missions. It was the first launch since the launch of 49 Starlink satellites on February 3. However, five days later, the business announced that up to 40 of them would re-enter the atmosphere owing to enhanced atmospheric resistance at the low altitudes where the satellites were positioned, preventing their electric propulsion systems from raising their orbits. In conclusion, 38 of the 49 satellites were re-entered. With this flight, SpaceX chose a unique strategy. Following a solitary burn of the upper stage, the satellites were sent into orbit at a perigee of 210 kilometers in the previous mission. A second fire was performed on this flight to deploy the satellites into a nearly circular orbit at an elevation of roughly 330 kilometers. The higher altitude lessens atmospheric drag, but it could also explain why this flight only carried three satellites compared to prior missions. In its launch webcast, SpaceX avoided discussing the loss of the majority of the last batch of Starlink satellites, emphasizing recent successes like an update on the progress of its Starship vehicle with the Polaris program of private crewed missions on Crew Dragon and Starship. Musk's first comprehensive update on Starship progress since a previous appearance in Boca Chica in September 2019 was described as the event arranged on short notice. An abundantly loaded vehicle with the Starship upper stage on top of a super heavy launcher served as the backdrop for the 75-minute demonstration. Musk argues that the vehicle will be ready to fly if the FAA grants a license in March. According to him, we're on track to achieve regulatory approval and hardware ready at the same time. Both will take a couple of months. He did not elaborate on what else needed to be done to have this vehicle ready for unveiling. Although there were a handful of crucial Starship upgrades available during the event, Musk spent most of the talk outlining the vehicle and highlighting the long-held ambition of utilizing it to make humans multiplanetary by building a self-sustaining settlement on Mars. A new film featuring a computer animation of a Starship mission to Mars was exhibited during the presentations. Musk did reveal some new details on the Raptor engine, which drives Starship. There are 29 Raptor engines in the initial Super Heavy rocket, with 33 in future boosters. At the moment, the Starship vehicle has 6 Raptors, but 9 could be added later. Raptor 2, a redesigned design that he regarded as a nearly total rebuild of the engine, is verified by SpaceX. The new model could generate at least 230 metric tons of force, up from 185 metric tons in the previous generation and eventually reached 250 metric tons. He also stated that the design of the latest version is simplified and less costly. Despite having far more thrust and being a lot easier and more robust engine to assemble, Raptor 2 costs roughly half as much as Raptor 1. Musk was worried about the Raptor engine's production. In November, Musk warned of a manufacturing catastrophe citing, very bluntly, a disaster in engine development. He asserted that the company would go bankrupt if the concerns were not addressed. Musk was far more upbeat about Raptor at the Boca Chica event. The production system is picking up steam, he said, 
adding that he hopes to be able to construct at least seven engines per week by March. For rocket engines, those are astounding figures. However, the most visible mission of the Starship is to land NASA astronauts on the Moon for the first time since 1972. Last April, NASA approved Starship for the Human Landing System, or HLS program, which will fund the construction of a lander version of Starship that would transport astronauts to the Moon's surface and back on the Artemis III mission, which is set to launch no sooner than 2025. Musk did not detail the lander version of Starship's progress, but maintained that it should not impede Starship's advancement as a launch vehicle. He said, I don't think there is indeed a contradiction there. We are going to produce a lot of ships and boosters, he says. Last September, Jared Isaacman, who funded and flew on the Inspiration4 Crew Dragon mission, announced the launch of the Polaris program in collaboration with SpaceX to help the company achieve its ambitions of sending humans to the Moon and Mars. In a conference with reporters, Isaacman described Polaris as a series of pioneering Dragon space missions that will try to develop capabilities for human exploration rapidly. This program was created to improve long-duration human spaceflight capabilities and move us toward the eventual goal of supporting Mars exploration. Polaris Dawn, the first mission, is scheduled to launch in the fourth quarter of 2022. The trip, which might last up to five days, will travel to a higher altitude than earlier Crew Dragon missions such as Isaacman's Inspiration4 mission, which reached a height of 585 kilometers. He stated, We're attempting to fly to the highest Earth orbit ever flown for a crewed mission. In 1966, Gemini 11 attained an elevation of approximately 1,375 kilometers. A new variant of the pressure suit worn by Crew Dragon astronauts will be used for extravehicular activity, or EVA, or spacewalk, the first on a commercial mission. The development of this suit and the EVA will be critical steps towards scalable design for spacesuits for forthcoming long-duration missions, he said. Due to the absence of an airlock on the Crew Dragon spacecraft, all four crew members will be required to put on suits to lower the cabin's pressure for the spacewalk. During the conversation, Isaacman and others working with Polaris revealed a few new specifics about the suit designs or plans for the spacewalk. Except for Inspiration4, which sent non-professional astronauts chosen in part through competitions, Isaacman stated he had already selected the Polaris Dawn crew. Scott Kidd Poteet, a veteran Air Force pilot among the ground directors for Inspiration4, will command the mission once more. Sarah Gillis and Anna Menon, both of SpaceX, will fly as mission specialists. In December, Menon is wedded to Anil Menon, a veteran SpaceX flight surgeon named to NASA's current astronaut class. Because Polaris Dawn's mission includes several critical objectives, we have chosen a crew of professionals in collaboration with SpaceX who are familiar with each other through our work together on Inspiration4 and have a foundation of trust on which we can develop, Isaacman said. During the hour-long press conference, Isaacman and the other members of the Polaris Dawn crew declined to discuss many aspects of the mission, including the planned spacewalk. Plans provide a second, tentative Crew Dragon mission accompanied by an orbital flight on Starship, the first launch of that vehicle that carries people. Isaacman used Inspiration4 to collect money for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. More than $240 million was raised, including $100 million from Isaacman and $50 million from Elon Musk upon the mission's completion. Polaris would also introduce awareness and funds for St. Jude, but only as part of a global health project, the specifics of which Isaacman did not provide beyond some form of telemedicine using SpaceX's Starlink satellite network. He said that Polaris Dawn intends to communicate through Starlink's laser intersatellite links. Future Polaris missions' timelines are likewise uncertain, in part due to Starship's continued development. The vehicle has yet to perform an orbital flight. The Federal Aviation Administration announced on February 14 that a deadline for completing an environmental evaluation essential for Starship's launch license would be pushed back from February 28 to March 28. The first crewed orbital flight would arrive after multiple uncrewed launches, most prominently for SpaceX's Starlink constellation. The second stage will make a third fire to deorbit itself once the satellites have deployed from the second stage. The satellites will then launch themselves into their operational orbit after a period of testing. In February, SpaceX is scheduled to launch two more Starlink satellites. 
At the Vandenberg Space Force Base, Starlink Groups 409 and 411 would launch in late February from LC-39A and SLC-4E respectively. Well, that's all we have today. If you enjoyed today's video, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Until we see you next time, ciao!